All right, so we are back here for the um, heart lab. This is the second part of the cardiovascular system um, labs. And this is exercise 17 in your lab books. So this is, I always love the heart lab. I don't know why, it's just one of my favorite labs. Everybody has their favorite. Um, and the heart is, is definitely one of my favorites. Um, and so I think the reason being for me is that the heart is just this amazing organ that it's able to actually pump blood all throughout our body. And it's such a small organ. You, if you look at it, the heart is really only about the size of your fist. And um, that just seems like such a small organ to do such amazing, an amazingly you know, important um, task for our bodies. So um, just as kind of a reminder, you probably remember this from lecture, but the cardiovascular system is composed of uh, not only the blood, which we covered in the last lab, also the heart, which you cover in this lab, and then the blood vessels in the next lab. And again, the main function of the cardiovascular system is to um, really circulate blood throughout the body. And that blood, right, is going to carry or transport um, nourishment or nutrients. It's going to transport, obviously, you know, your gases, your um, very important gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then it's also going to transport waste materials for waste removal. So um, again, the cardiovascular system has these really, really vital functions um, to the body. And the heart is the cool part is the heart is the propulsion system for right the jet propulsion for shooting that blood um, through the blood vessels to transport that blood throughout the body and so um when we go through the anatomy of the heart um try to keep and i'm going to try to go through the anatomy of the heart um it, when i go through the internal kind of um, anatomy of the heart i'm going to try to help do that in a manner that reminds you of the blood circulation through the heart. So I'm going to go through a couple features just on the outside, the exterior, what we call the exterior anatomy of the heart, and then I'll go through the internal anatomy. And as I go through the internal anatomy, I'm going to try to, again, do it in, in a matter where we can go through the actual blood flow through the heart. So if you look here um, in the heart, here are the two oracles of the heart. And then here um, are going to be the ventricles of the heart down here. And <clears throat> when we say oracles of the heart, um, I have two different models here to show you. But these oracles are part of the atria. So you'll also, you can call them atria oracles. The difference between, the again, the term atrium, the atrium is the actual chamber. And that includes the oracle. The oracle is this like extra kind of sac part that sticks out and allows for expansion of that chamber. So um, again, you know, it the, the oracle is part of the atrium, which I think is kind of confusing for students. So again, the oracle is part of the atrium. It's just this sac-like portion. The atrium includes, again, the, the, the chamber inside, um, as well as the oracle. So when you look at, again, um, the heart here, you've got the right um, atrium, and you can, it's hard, but if you can turn this heart around and put it in your own um, into your own chest cavity. And again, remember the heart is just going to lie. It lies in the thoracic cavity and actually the mediastinum, right? And what borders the heart is you have that actual meat, the um, sternum, right? So you have the breastbone or the sternum on the anterior portion of the heart. And so this side of the heart is actually the anterior portion of the heart that would be up against the sternum. And then the posterior portion of the heart, which you can't see here, the posterior portion of the heart is the back of the heart that would be bordered by the vertebra. And then, of course, um, uh, lateral to the heart on either side would be the lungs. So this is the anterior surface um, of, of the heart. And so if you could turn that heart around and put it inside um, your own heart, right, or in, inside your own body, you would see that this is the right atrium, okay? And this is the left atrium or the left oracle of the left atrium. 
And so this would be then the right ventricle and this would be the left ventricle. So when you um, look at a couple of the other features that you can see here, just while I'm showing you kind of the external anatomy, um, you can see, of course, the aortic arch. This portion of the aorta we, we call the ascending aorta. This is the aortic arch, and then this would be the descending aorta. Same here, ascending aortic arch, and then descending aorta. Um, here you can see this is going to be part of the pulmonary trunks. And then we're going to talk about the pulmonary trunk. Sorry, pulmonary trunk, not trunks, pulmonary trunk. And the pulmonary trunk is then going to bifurcate and then branch into what's called the pulmonary arteries. And those pulmonary arteries are tricky. This is the one that catches most students because the pulmonary arteries are actually going to be carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs. The trick here is to remember that arteries carry blood away. So think A, arteries A, away from the heart. So any vessel that's carrying blood away from the heart is going to be an artery. And so that makes this really tricky for some students. We'll go through this as we go through the blood flow through the heart as I go through some of the internal anatomy. Um, so <clears throat> those are just a couple of things. Now, um, some of the anatomy that you can't see in terms of um, the external anatomy of the heart here. Oh, and really quick, um, also just if you're wondering what these are back here. Um, so here, this tube here is the trachea, which is kind of nice, and this is the esophagus right behind it. So again, your trachea, your airway, and you can see that it's got the kind of rib uh, rings of cartilage, right? So that helps you to know that that's the trachea. And then right behind it is gonna be the esophagus. So kind of cool that it shows that on this model. Also some external anatomy here that you can't see specifically is you're not gonna be able to see the pericardial sac on this. Um, remember the peri pericardial sac is going to be um, this double layer, right? Double membrane uh, or double layer membrane um, that surrounds the heart and Inside is going to be the pericardial cavity in between the two layers of membrane, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and it's going to have serous fluid. And the reason that it has that is because the heart is constantly contracting, right, and moving. And it, if you can picture in the chest cavity, if the heart was contracting and didn't have the pericardial sac, it would constantly get wear and tear on it from friction up against the lungs, um, up against the vertebra, and up against the sternum. And that would be really bad for the heart, right? So it needs this pericardial sac, this gelatinous sac around it to kind of buffer it from that friction. And so that is the pericardial sac and it's filled with that serous fluid, that gelatinous serous fluid. And then of course, the out, outer portion, the outer membrane of that sac um, is going to be called the parietal pericardium, okay? And that parietal pericardium is the outer layer. Then you're going to have the serous fluid. And then you'll have the inner layer that really um, helps to form the outer wall of the heart. And that is going to be the visceral pericardium or also you can call it the epicardium. Okay. So those are the layers that you don't see here. You can't see those. And I know you've done those in lecture, but I just wanted to remind you of those. <laughs> so now... When we talk about um, the internal anatomy of the heart here, this is where it kind of gets cool because um, you, I'm going to try to do this in terms of the blood flow of the heart, but first I need to point out a couple of, uh, of features. So you're going to have two separate sets of valves, right, of these uh, one-way valves, and this is going to help to prevent backflow from as the heart pumps blood from one chamber to the next. So the first two valves that you probably can see pretty prominently here are the atrioventricular valves, okay? The atrioventricular valves. And um, so the second set of valves that you're going to see here are the semilunar valves. And you can only see the one here. You can't see the, um, the aortic semilunar valve, but you can um, see the pulmonary semilunar valve here. So those are our, our, our four, four valves. And again, we have break them up into two sets, the atrioventricular valves and then the semilunar valves. So as blood is pumped from the atrium to the ventricle, and in this case, it's the right atrium to the right ventricle, it's going to go through this right atrioventricular valve, also called the right AV valve, AV valve 
or also called the tricuspid valve. So um, one of the tricks that I, and you can name any one <laughs> of those names on your exam. You can put right AV valve or you can put tricuspid tricuspid. Now for the exam, you'll notice that sometimes I only put tricuspid um, as an option. I might not put right AV valve, but for the purposes of the lab and labeling, you can put either. Um, but my trick for you to remember this is as you go through the blood flow through the heart, um, you always are going to go through the tricuspid valve before the bicuspid valve. So, and again, the tricuspid has three cusps um, to that valve and the bicuspid has two cusps. Um, the tricuspid valve, um, it, or the trick to remembering the tricuspid and the bicuspid is that you want to try something before you buy something. So I always say, try it before you buy it. So the tricuspid valve in your blood flow through the heart is going to come before the bicuspid valve. Okay. So again, just um, a couple of different features. Um, so again, you can name this valve here is the other right atrioventricular valve or the tricuspid valve. Now, the tricky part is this one here um, has an extra name. So you can either call it the left atrioventricular valve or you can call it, um, I don't know where my pointer went. There we go. So you can call it the left atrioventricular valve or you can call it the bicuspid valve or it also has this other name called the mitral valve. And you'll hear the mitral valve more um, for those of you that are gonna be in the kind of the medical world. Um, if you're going on to nursing or to be a paramedic, you're likely more likely to hear mitral valve than bicuspid. Um, and the mitral valve is kind of the kind of old, old, old name that we gave um, the uh, bicuspid valve because it looked like the hat of a mitre with the, the or the, the mitre hat, sorry, of a bishop with uh, the, the two cusps to it, so to the valve. And so, and those valves themselves um, are going to consist of, um, well, the valves are going to be connected to these very special muscles, right, that um, help to contract to pull the valve closed. These muscles are called papillary muscles. So here is a papillary muscle right here, and here is a papillary muscle right here. And then these um, string-like structures that are connected to the pap that connect basically the cusps of the valve to the papillary muscles are actually called the cordy tendony. So here's the cordy tendony um, for the bicuspid valve, and here's the cordy tendony for the tricuspid valve, which they tried to show you the three cusps with branching the um, cordy tendony there. Um, so. And with that, um, that brings me to the types of muscle that we see. So remember when we talk about the heart, we have kind of the three layers to the heart. We have the epicardium, which is the very outer fibrous um, layer, the visceral pericardium, right? Then we have what's called the myocardium. And then the very inner layer of tissue is the epicardium, or that, I'm sorry, the endocardium, not the epicardium, the epicardium is out here. Um, so again, we have the epicardium or um, what we also call um, uh, the uh, visceral pericardium. And then I know there's two names for it. You can either call that outer layer the epicardium or the visceral pericardium. Um, which, whichever you so choose um, to use. And then we have the myocardium. Myo means muscle. So this part's easy. This is the chunky part of the heart right here, right? Um, so this is the myocardium. And then the endocardium is just going to be this little in inner layer that lines the heart and lines the chambers. So the myocardium is this big muscular part. And what's cool is even on this model, um, they make this distinction. And this is one of the ways when you do a dissection, you can see the left ventricle or identify the left ventricle right away, right away is the myocardium on the left side of the heart is going to be much thicker. And so I'm going to give you a second to think about why that might be. If you know the blood flow through the heart. So the answer to this question is that the right ventricle is pumping blood out to the lungs. Doesn't have far to go, right? Lungs are not too far, they're on either side of the heart. The left ventricle needs a thick muscular wall because the left ventricle has to do one ginormous pump, right, to push that blood 
all the way out through the aorta. So it's going to push the blood through the aorta. And then, um, and you can't see where it connects to the aorta here. I'm sorry about that. But um, so it's going to pump the blood out through the aorta and then all the way up to your head, all the way down to your toes. Um, and, and then back right on that pump. So, so that is why the left side of the heart and the left myocardium, the left ventricular myocardium is going to be so much thicker. So that's one of the really easy ways if you're looking at a heart model and you're like, mm, I don't know which side is which, look for this thick, chunky myocardium. And that is the left ventricle. So that's one of the easy ways to orient yourself. Um, this um, right here is also in, in between the two sides of the heart. Um, we have the interventricular septum. So, right, the interventricular septum um, is going to, and sorry, it's going to separate the ventricles. So it'll separate the right ventricle from the left ventricle. We also have an interatrial septum, but you can't see that here. Um, so those are a couple of the features there um, that you'll see. Then um, we, oh, as we're talking about muscle, I want to really quick um, talk about the two types of muscle that you're going to see. So you're going to see these ridges and you won't see these ridges as much um, in the models, but you do see the ridges in your actual dissection. And these ridges of the myocardium, the muscle, um, are going to be given two separate names for the types of, of muscle um, that you have here. So in the ventricles, we have these um, thicker, more prominent um, ridges, and the ridges are actually created by these like parallel strands of um, cardiac muscle tissue. And we call them, they're known as the trabeculi carni. So the trabeculi carni are going to be these more prominent ridges that you're going to see in the ventricles. And obviously the most prominent of the trabeculi carni would be the papillary muscle. Um, that's the, the largest one. So the trabeculi carni, again, um, is the name that we give these ridges, just these kind of st string-like ridges um, that you can see here to the muscle in um, the left ventricle. Now in the atrium, which you can't see here, um, you won't actually see the pec, what we call the pectinate muscle. So kind of on the anterior side of um, the atrium, you will actually see these parallel uh, arrangement, the parallel kind of lines or parallel arrangement of cardiac muscle that's gonna form these ridges. And those ridges are gonna be called the pectinate muscles inside the atria. So the atria have pectinate muscle, which forms the ridges in them, and then the ventricles are gonna have the trabeculi carni. So, kinda cool. Okay, I know I'm trying to keep going, I'm trying to keep this moving, because it's always, I feel like there's so much to talk about with the heart. But now that I've kind of given you, I think, the basic um, orientation to the heart, um, I'm gonna go ahead and go through the blood flow through the heart the easiest way that I know how to for you. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna start with the blood flow into the heart and I don't have all of the vessels here, but I'll do my best. So here in, in this orientation, if I had the actual heart model, which um, I, I wished I had it with me, but I didn't have it with me. So um, I'm just gonna go through this on this, this uh, 2D, you know, this, picture, which is not a great, um, great way to do it. But if um, you could picture a model of this heart, um, I'm going to try to show you where some of the vessels will come in. So again, if you're talking about the blood flow to the heart, we're going to start with the deoxygenated blood coming back to the heart. And it's going to come back to the heart, to the right atrium of the heart, which is right here via the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, okay? So the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava are gonna dump in, dump the deoxygenated blood into the right atrium. That right atrium is gonna contract, pushing the blood through the tricuspid valve, remember try it before you buy it, tricuspid valve or the right atrioventricular valve into the right ventricle, okay? Now the right ventricle is going to contract, and as it contracts, it's going to force the blood through the right 
uh, semilunar valve or what I call the pulmonary semilunar valve because it's going into the pulmonary trunk. So here's the pulmonary semilunar valve here and then into the pulmonary trunk. Still deoxygenated blood right at this point. Now that deoxygenated blood is going to be pushed from the pulmonary trunk, branch into the pulmonary arteries. From here, it's going to travel to the lungs. Um, it's going to pick up oxygen, dump its carbon dioxide, pick up oxygen in the lungs, and then come back to the heart in the form of the pulmonary veins. So you see the trick here? The pulmonary arteries are actually carrying deoxygenated blood in this case. Okay? Going to the, because everyone wants to think of arteries carrying oxygenated blood, but they don't always. In the case of the heart, we always remember that arteries are carrying blood away from the heart. So pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries, carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs, picking up oxygen, dumping their carbon dioxide, coming back to the heart in the pulmonary veins that are carrying oxygenated blood. So you can see the entry of the pulmonary veins here. And here's the pulmonary veins right here. So they, again, are dumping into now the left atrium of the heart, okay? The left atrium of the heart is gonna give one big pump, okay? And push that blood through the now bicuspid or mitral valve or left atrioventricular valve. Okay. So, but again, I like to, I always tell students, if you remember tricuspid, bicuspid, try it before you buy it. That's an easy way. If again, you're going into the medical world after this, you want to make sure that you know that the bicuspid valve is also called the mitral valve. So, okay. So again, um, the blood is going to move from that left atrium to the left ventricle through the bicuspid or the mitral valve into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is then going to give one large contraction, okay? And it's now going to push that blood valve or the aortic semilunar valve, because that's what it is. It's, it's going, the blood's going into the aorta and it's a semilunar valve. So the aortic semilunar valve into now the aorta. And the first part of this makes sense, right? Ascending aorta because it's traveling up then the aortic arch, and then the descending aorta. And so then, now that oxygenated blood will travel from the aorta, branch again throughout um, the arteries throughout the body, and then to the tissues, and where it will dump that oxygen to the tissues uh, at, the, at the capillary beds, and then pick up the carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide then will be transported back through the veins, um, to eventually the vena cava um, into the, back into the heart again. Um, so that's kind of the whole big picture circle of, of the heart. So here's kind of cool because um, this is uh, just another heart model and it just depicts some of the things a little bit better. Like here you can see the pectinate muscle um, that's depicted in the uh, right atrium here. You can see also the trabeculae carni that's depicted a little better, the ridges here in the ventricles. And then here you can see um, they, I think, tried to do a better job of doing the, showing you the cusps. So you can't see see quite as well, but you can see the, the cordy tendon kind of are branched into these three cusps. And that's showing you the tricuspid valve, the three cusps to the three cusps to the tricuspid valve. There's your cordy tendon. Um, and then here's of course your papillary muscle. Um, and then you can also see here this was broken up into the two cusp for your bicuspid valve with your cordy tendon. And then there of course is your pulmonary semilunar valve. Um, so again, just a different, different model of the heart. This is just showing you the back of the heart. So this is kind of nice because you can see, again, this is the esophagus, the trachea. Um, you'll see this is the, this is hard. I won't give you the back of a heart because it's really difficult to identify the structures, but this is actually the superior vena cava. And then here, these structures um, are actually going to be the pulmonary veins coming in. Um, so again, just a, a little bit of a different view of um, the heart here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and end the slideshow here. I've given you the only thing that um, this doesn't depict very well is uh, the fossa ovalis. 
And um, the fossa ovalis is just simply this. You could see it in your lab manual. Um, let me see what page it shows you the fossa ovalis on, um, which is a good one. Oh, so if you look at um, page 187, you'll see the fossa ovalis. The fossa ovalis is just kind of a, a vestigial structure. It's a, literally a depression. And it's basically the remnant of what was the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale was an opening um, that... Uh, in in a fetus um, allows blood to shunt between the atria. It, it allows kind of a, a bypass um, and it allows blood to shunt between the atria um, so that it can bypass circulation to the lungs that are developing, right? Because the mother is providing um, the oxygenated blood at that point through, um, through uh, the placenta. So uh, in the um, umbilical cord. So so um, that's kind of a cool thing to know, the, the fossa ovalis. Um, I, I believe that's all for the structures of the heart that you need to know. I'm just making sure that I didn't forget anything. We did the right atrium. And then I'm going to go ahead and now show you this on a beef heart. I'm also, I'm going to go ahead and post um, a dissection of the beef heart. Because unfortunately, I tried and tried and tried. I've been trying for over a month to get a beef heart for you. And um, they all come butterflied. I even had a butcher that was going to provide the heart. They were going to special order them for me, which they did. And they got in these seven beef hearts and they all came butterflied, even though they were told they weren't going to be. Um, and, and so you're going to see that my beef heart is pretty butchered. So what I'll do is I will show you some of the structures on the beef heart that I have. And then I'll also post um, another dissection for you on the beef heart so that you can see the structures. The beef heart is my favorite for the dissections because it's so large. So. Go. So this is a beef heart that I obtained from a local butcher. And um, the challenge is that all the local butchers um, get the beef hearts already butterflied. So it's already sectioned pretty poorly. But um, what I want to show you with this is that um, you can orient yourself with certain features even on a heart that's butchered this poorly. So, or actually I shouldn't say it was butchered poorly. It was dissected poorly, but probably butchered just the way they like it. But, um, so this is a beef heart and I choose to use the beef hearts because um, they are so large. Um, you can see in the United States, um, the way that we raise cows, um, you can see they, they build up quite a bit of fat on the heart. Um, so one of the first ways that you can orient yourself to the heart is you can see what's called the apex of the heart. And that's the very bottom, the most posterior portion of the heart that comes to a point, okay? And the other way that you can orient and how I orient to the anterior surface of the heart is what we call the anterior interventricular sulcus. So right here, and you'll see there's a, a especially in the B parts, there's a line of fat um, that runs there too. So that's the anterior interventricular sulcus. So that tells me that this is the anterior portion of the heart. And so if that's the anterior side of the heart, then this has to be the right atrium and the right ventricle, and this is the left atrium and left ventricle. Now what's really cool on the beef hearts is that you can see, um, especially since um, this left um, oracle is intact pretty well, is the oracles. Remember, these are just um, part of the atrium, it's the sac-like portion of the atrium that allows for expansion of that chamber. So um, again, that's, keep this in mind as I open this up. So as I open this up, remember that this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle. Set the, set the heart down towards this, towards the red edge a little bit. Oh, right here? You're, you're, okay. you're, you just pushed it out of the form that one. There you go. There, is that good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so as I open this up, remember here that this was the left atrium, okay? And again, it's pretty, you'll see it was pretty kind of butchered. <laughs> and so that means that here's the left atrium, here is the left ventricle. So you're talking about the left side of the heart. Now what makes this really challenging is this right here is actually the interventricular septum. So what that means is you have some of the left ventricle here and left ventricle here. Okay? So all of this is the right ventricle. Then um, the other challenge is here is the right atrium. 
so it's a little tricky because um, it, it's pretty butchered pretty poorly. So again, here is um, what would be the right atrium here with the right oracle. Um, if you can see that, that may be in the way. There's the right oracle. And then here, all of this is gonna be the right ventricle. Um, what I want you to be able to see in, in this um, beef heart is you can see some of the structures that you can't see in a model. So remember that we talked about the pectinate muscles, these ridges in the atria that formed the pectinate muscles. So this is the pectinate muscles of the atria. You can see it in both the atria. So that was the right atrium and here is the left atrium. So there's those nice pectinate muscles. Um, the other thing that you can see is I want you to notice and one of the ways that I can, as I open up the heart, can tell that this is the left ventricle is remember that that myocardium is gonna be really thick in the left ventricle because remember it has to pump the blood all the way to the extremities, all the way to the head. Um, so you are gonna have a really thick myocardium and you can see that here in the interventricular septum and here and here because again remember this is part of the left ventricle as you close this up okay so here is the inter interventricular septum that would connect here and then here is part of the left ventricle the myocardium of the left ventricle so you can really see how thick that is okay um, they don't have a, a section well you can kind of see right here they sectioned a little bit they better fly into the uh, right ventricle here and the right ventricle is much thinner Okay, and again, remember that's because the right ventricle, which is all of this in here, the right ventricle is just pumping to the lungs. So it doesn't have too far to go. Now, what you can see here is, let's go back to the right ventricle here. We know that this is the right atrium right here. So that means this valve right here is the right atrioventricular valve. And um, remember, we also call that the tricuspid valve because you try it before you buy it. So this is the tricuspid valve. What's cool is that you, in the beef heart, because it's so large, um, you can see a little bit of the cusps left, but you can really see these cordy tendony, and then you can see these papillary muscles. So that's really nice. And then remember, you can see these ridges here, um, in the, and you can actually see them a little bit better in the right ventricle here. The ridges that you see in the muscle here in the ventricles, remember we call those the trabeculi carni. And the most prominent of the trabeculi carni, you can really see here in the left ventricle, are, are the papillary muscles. So there's a papillary muscle, and that's a really big papillary muscle right there. And you can see that it is attached to the cordy tendony, um, and then they're attached to what is the bicuspid or mitral valve or left atrioventricular valve. So again, that one has many names. But again, remember if you're in the medical world, you're likely to hear mitral valve used um, more commonly if you're just, if you're just in the research world, they more likely use the left atrioventricular or bicuspid. Um, so again, that's about all that you can see. I really wanted you to see that nice um, thick interventricular septum. I wanted you to really see that thick myocardium of the left ventricle. I wanted you to really be able to see the pectinate muscle that you can see so well on the atria. And then um, I, I also wanted you to be able to see um, how to orient yourself on the heart. And you can see these or the, the oracles quite nicely. If I can kind of turn it around, you can probably see the oracles um, a little bit better. So those are some of the structures that you can see as well as um, the anterior interventricular sulcus here. Um, and so those are some of the structures that I really wanted you to be able to see. There's the anterior interventricular sulcus. Um, and those are the structures that you can see quite nicely on a beef heart. I am going to post a beef heart dissection for you that is uh, a complete, a whole beef heart so you can see some of these structures a little bit better.